There are some in here that have been married longer than I have. Um, if you've been married longer than 29 years, raise your hand. Okay, or, or were. And, and um, some in here that have been married less than that period of time. But I can promise you that after 29 years in my situation, six days without my wife was uh, a challenge for Jeff. It was so quiet around there, I thought I was going to die. You know what I mean? I thought I was going to die. It was healthy in some ways, but it was uh, interesting. My first thought was, uh, okay, food. We don't want to spend, I want to have all the money that needed, and we didn't have a lot of money, so I, I thought, survival, you know, do I need to go out back, and, and, and do I need to hunt him, Jose, do I need to kill something? You know, in the neighborhood, and eat it, and, and go, you know, rub sticks together to make fire. What do I need to do to survive? So I started by going to the fridge. And uh, I started looking around, and I started thinking, there's a lot of stuff here, but it's normally stuff Mindy cooks. So Houston, we have a problem. So then I went down and looked in the freezer, and I started finding stuff I could warm up. By the second day, what a survivor I was. I was making bacon, eggs, grits. I wanted to take a picture of them. I might have taken a picture of them and sent them to Minnie, but I was surviving really well. Really well. And I, I got to thinking, turn me down just a little bit, uh, Jose. I got to thinking, on the monitors anyway. I got to thinking, we are so blessed in this country. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Me thinking there was no food there was, uh, was a, 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 just a pitiful thought because there's enough there to survive for months. And, um, and so rather than make bacon for three kids, uh, you make it for one person. And, and the fact that there was food in the freezers, food in the fridge, food in the cupboard, it got me thinking of how blessed we are. Amen. And, um, and how I, at least I have, taken those blessings for granted. Have you ever done that? Amen. What if it was all gone in a moment? What if it was gone? <clears throat> Food, something to drink, the water contaminated. Would this country survive that? I don't know. We, uh, we're in the book of Joel. I want to kind of tell you where we're headed, too. We're going to bring this to verse 14 and 15. I think it's 15 today. And then we take a pause because we're going to talk about the birth of Jesus through the month of December. It's a perfect time to pause. Because then we're going to talk about the day of the Lord. Now, if God allows us to get to that point, if I live and we get to January and we come back to Joel, then we'll study it then, the day of the Lord. If God chooses, we may be, as, uh, as I know at least one of you will understand, we may be learning of this and watching from the mezzanine. Amen? So I don't know. I don't know what will happen between now and January, but just so you know, we're going to transition out at this perfect time uh, in, in, in the Word. In verse 15, there is a transition, and then we'll come back to it in January. But let's talk about Joel. Joel was a prophet. Um, it is believed uh, he was an early prophet to Judah. Uh, probably around the time of King Joash, around 835 B.C., around the time of Elijah and Elisha. Um, Three weeks ago, we learned of the dearth, verse 1 through 4. Then, two weeks ago, we considered the drunkards, verse 5. Last week, we considered the depravity. And verse 7 forward today, today we see the despair. Um, you know, I thought, it's getting close to the time of year, though dating is probably not correct, but we celebrate Christmas. It should be a time of joy. And, uh, and I'm thinking, however, and as I sat there in my, in my loneliness for six days, in all seriousness, there's a lot of people that don't have joyful times this time of year. Is that right? That's, that's just not always the case. Not always the case. For the nation that rejects God. Let me ask you up front. Do you think that we... We are a Christian nation? Do you think as a whole 
that we have rejected God as a nation. Amen. Amen. For the nation that rejects God, expect despair and sadness. But for you born again Christian, we will be heading into a season, we will be reminded God sent us a deliverer, his name is Jesus. No matter what this country does, if your heart is given to Jesus, if you're born again, if you're saved, if Jesus is your Savior, no matter what this happens in this whole world, you're going to be safe with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen? With all that said, please stand out of reverence to God and His Word. Grab your Bible. Joel, chapter 1, verse 1. Let's review a little bit. Joel, chapter 1, verse 1. The Word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the pommel worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Verse 5. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth, the fangs, that is, of a great lion. Praise God for his word. Please be seated. <clears throat> we want to pick up in verse 7, and we see the despair, and let's look at it together. Look close at verse 7. He hath laid my vine waste. That doesn't sound good at all, does it? And barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. We're talking about these insects, I believe, that were used in judgment against the land of Judah. We're talking, reminding you of the early verses. We're talking about this, this, uh, this locust invasion and those little dudes can chew it up can't they amen they can chew it up gary i think it was gary was telling me something they can strip the bark can't they they can strip the bark off the tree um i saw a video this guy was behind he had his phone he had his phone like this and you know those of you that are phone savvy you're getting there when you do a video you can push a little button here in the corner and it flips around so you're taking a video yourself so as he's talking, he's behind a Walmart, and there are 50, to, I, I didn't count them, but there's 50 to 100 buggies. Now, y'all call, is that right? We call them buggies down here? Buggies? In the north, we call them carts. You have to forgive me. But for the sake of, like Paul said, when you're in Rome, you know what I mean? So I'm in the south, so there's 50 to 100 Buggies. There, we, don't, right? we don't care how you did it up. No. Yeah. Uh, and, he's, <laughs> and he's videotaping himself, and he's looking at, at these carts, and every one of them was slammed full of food. And he's picking them up, and he's looking at the expiration date that had not even arrived yet. And he says, he says, they're going to throw all of this away. Nobody can have it. They're throwing it all away. About the time he's telling them, here comes a Walmart manager, and he doesn't look happy at all. And he interviews them. We are a country that is blessed, right? Yeah. And we throw food away when people, even in this country, are starving to death. Something wrong with that picture, isn't it? Amen. Some starve, some throw away. I've even caught myself throwing stuff away that I know many people. What did our parents tell us when we were little? Those of you that are from my generation. There are children. People in China. Somebody said Africa. Who's, whose parents said Africa? China. <laughs> okay. China. I got the China one. But they're right. 
There are people starving in parts of this world, and and uh, I'm thinking of that that Christmas movie, uh, Christmas story. Is it Christmas story? Where the dad says, "Open his mouth, and I'll shovel the potatoes down his throat." Right? In, in this country, we, we we tend to throw stuff away. I think a day may come in our li lifetime right. that we regret that. Yeah. Are we a blessed nation? How long do you think we'll be blessed? That's the question. The nation under God's judgment, the blessings will be stripped away. In the same way God can use a huge number of locusts to strip the bark off a tree, he can strip a nation of blessings. Why would God bless a nation that utterly, re that utterly rejects him? That's right. Why would he continue to when our government Within our, a bunch of athletes now, a, a bunch of people that are in the limelight, basically spit on the cross. Yeah. I mean, how long before he says, I'll protect you Christians, but I'm bringing the hammer on the United States of America. Amen. Amen. When a nation or a church, listen, I want to I give you some J. Vernon McGee, because this was actually from his quotes in Jeremiah, but it fits so well here. Listen, to, how many of you heard of J. Vernon McGee? He's in heaven now. It's such a, it's like listening to a country boy break yeah. down uh, Hebrew and Greek. It's Amen. awesome. When a nation or a church or an individual rejects God, God rejects them. Amen. Friends, you are free to reject God. That is your free will. But remember, if you reject God, God will reject you. He is gracious, he is good, he is patient and long-suffering. He gives you ample opportunity to turn to him. Amen. But it is sobering to see what happens to, my, uh, to any privileged people who refuse God, be it Israel or be it the church. Now, he was writing this in his day, which was several years ago. I will add, be it, I will add, be it you or me. If a person rejects God long enough, that's a sad place to be because yeah. there's that land of reprobate, yep. Romans 1. Now we have too many people today who give a pretense of being a follower of the living and true God. That is, in Jeff Henry's words, they're playing games. Many of them are members in the churches today. We often hear the expression that we are a Christian nation in America. I say we are not a Christian nation. There is no emphasis on the word of God, and we are not following the living and true God. Amen. Thoughts from Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Amen. Do you agree with that? Say amen. 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 What makes us a Christian? Let's participate and let's do it with just short answers. Not looking for a long dialogue today. Just a, It's going to be true or false. Okay, What makes us a Christian? True or false? I am a Christian. True. true. Somebody said true? So, let's do it again. True or false? I am a Christian. True. True. Okay. true or false? I am a Christian because I celebrate Christmas. False. false. True or false? I'm a Christian because I go to church once in a while. False. Especially on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> I'm a Christian because I do more Christian work than most people in the pews. False. I'm a Christian because I believe Jesus died for me. Amen. <laughs> Romans 5 8, 1 Peter 3 18, mark it down. Romans 5 8, uh, 1 Peter 3 18. I'm a Christian because I know I am a repentant sinner. True, True or false? True. True. Romans 3 23, Acts 2 19, 1 John 1 9. True or false? I am a Christian because I have confessed Jesus as Lord. True. I am a Christian because I believe he arose from the dead. True. True. True or false, I am a Christian because I called upon Jesus to save me. True. True. 
Romans 10, 9 and 10, and Romans 10, 13. I'm a Christian because I am born again. John 3, 3. I'm a Christian because I am a new creation in Christ. True. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Your life, if you've been saved, if you're a born-again believer, if, your life, if you turn your life over to Jesus Christ, surrendered to Him as Lord, and you've called on Him and said, Jesus, save me, from that time forward, you should not be, uh, maybe it's only been a week, but let's say it's been longer than a week. You should see the change happening in your life as God... Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, loves on you, changes you, guides your path, is a light unto your path. Amen. You should be in God's Word. You should be coming to church. Amen. You should be doing all the things that people that love Jesus want to do. Amen. So it blows my mind when somebody has no want to to go to church. I'm wondering, but that's between them and Jesus. I want to be in the place where I can love on Jesus who loved me first. Amen. Amen. <laughs> blows my mind. The games that people play, and it's sad, but that's between them and the Lord. I'm a Christian because I believe in Him and I put my trust in Him. John 3.16. Back to Jude. Verse 8 says, look at Joel. Verse 8 says, lament. What does that mean? Cry out, wail. How many of you, by a show of hands, Try to, when, when that time, how many of you have cried before? Let's start there. Okay. Is there anybody that has never cried? Because I'm going to pray hard for you. Uh, how many, if you, if you cry, how many of you now, ladies especially, but men join in, would say that you control your cry and you have a dignified southern lady-like cry? The tears come down, but, but, but you are dignified. Any reason why if you're a controlled crier, you are not a control crier at all. <laughs> Raise your hand now if you wail and uh, when, when, I mean, something hits you, and this isn't a joke, this isn't meant to be funny, but something really bad happens, and then you're, you're sobbing out loud. I mean, you're losing control. Raise your hand if that's it. That's the picture we get here in verse 8. Lament, wail is what it means, like a virgin girded with uh, sackcloth for her husband of her youth. Let's break that down for just a minute. Think about a young lady, say, in her 20s who gets engaged to the, the knight in shining armor, the, the one that she was sure God sent to her, and he's, he's got it all together. He's got the money, he's got the fine haircut, he's got the nice ride, and she's so in love, she melts at the sight of him. This is serious now, because it ain't going to a good place. And the, the engagement goes on for a year. Watch now. It's going to take, this is one of those sagas you weren't looking for. Here comes the curveball. And then he dies in a car crash, and he's gone through her life just like that. That ever happened in this world? <laughs> wailing. She will be wailing <coughs> at the loss. Unfair, it would seem. Now, the loss to the nation of Judah and all they were about to, all they were losing, because of sin, I mind you, they were to wail for that loss in a similar way. Don't be surprised if we lament too in a short period of time, everything that we know and understand is gone. Verse 9, the, the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, they mourn. No way to make an offering. The ministers and, and the sobered up drunks, they wail together the grapes and the food is gone. Picture no more food at Emsley First Baptist Church. No Sunday afternoon meal. You guys are experienced. You've worked at Nothing Lost Outreach and taken to the streets for many years, serving hungry people. Imagine if we went out there with the big school bus God gave us to pick up 
folks who brought them back and said, today there will be no food. How would that go, Mark? <coughs> How many would show up if all we served was the B I B L E? You know, we could pick on that crowd, but how many would show up here if all we were serving was the Bible? When the ministers mourn, we need to be real about this. There's no preaching a feel-good message when things are bad. We don't need to fake it, tickle ears, because the trouble is real. Yeah. You know, when it's bad and it's a time to cry, go ahead and cry. My little girls are almost perfect. I mean, it's close. <clears throat> In the blood of Christ applied, they are perfect, but I mean... Even then, they're almost there. And I'm missing them so much. And they came in last night, and they came straight up and sat on Daddy's lap in my chair. And life was good again. So they sat there a while, and loved on them, kissed on them, and, and, and they were telling me about their trip to Michigan. And, and off they went to put stuff away and to put their suitcase away. And, and, and these girls can turn, you know a kid that can just turn it on and off just like this, that they, I mean, real crocodile tears with just turn, turning the button on in a minute. And so off they go, and two minutes pass, and here comes Violet. And she is heartbroken, and the tears are rolling down her face. And Mom's rolling her eyes like, what now? And Dad's like, come here, baby. Come here and tell Daddy all about it. Get up here and tell me. I said, what happened, baby? What happened? Daddy put my suitcase away, and I wanted to. <laughs> Mindy rolled her eyes again, and I said, Maddie, come here. And Mindy's like, it's probably good she put it away, because it probably wouldn't have got put away anyway. So here comes Maddie. I said, give each other a hug, and Dad made everything perfect again. But they could turn those tears on and off. And we try to teach them. Uh, there are times for tears. There are good reasons to cry. For example, like a like a death, like a like a relationship that breaks up. A suitcase is somewhere down here. <laughs> <laughs> but they dropped the lid, and Daddy caves just about every time. <laughs> and we try and teach them. That there are reasons to cry, there are reasons not to cry. God is telling the preachers, and, and, and I feel like he's on me right now about this, because we think that we're okay, but we're not. Amen. That's Amen. Right. We're not okay in this country. Yep. We're in a very dangerous place with God. Amen. I'm, I'm not just talking about, I'm just talking about the reprobates and the and the people that are lost, and that's what they do. I'm talking about the body of Christ in America. It's a dangerous, dangerous place. <clears throat> Lukewarm. The fire. It shouldn't take a preacher shouting or a church having the greatest performance to get somebody that's truly born again fired up to come and worship God. Yeah. Because... If Jesus truly was God to all people that call themselves Christians, it wouldn't take these exterior things. Right. It would just take, I need to be with Jesus. I need to worship my Jesus. There's a lukewarm wave of apathy that flows like a cancer through the, the church in the United States of America. We're, in, we're not in a good place. God is telling the preachers that that this particular law sends you to, to cry because it's a bad situation. It's cry worthy. The sin that brings great loss. The drunks and the ministers weeping together. Verse 10. The field is wasted. The land mourneth for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up, the oil languishes. Consider 
a nuclear winter in the United States of America. The bottoms have all fallen. There's only a few people left with poisoned air in their lungs. No food. And if there was food, most of it's contaminated. The crops are destroyed. They're poisoned. The few survivors mourn, obviously. The land is poisoned, but worse yet, those that survive that are Christians are mourning. Lost loved ones had died during the war. Wouldn't matter if it's November or December, if it's a time of year when you're supposed to force happiness because that's what we force. It wouldn't matter if something like this were to happen. There'd be mourning. That would be a cry worthy moment. Amen? Amen. You ever been so concerned about somebody in your family that if they died, they'd go to hell? That yeah. you took it upon yourself to pray for them? That you even took it a step further and you shared the Bible with them? That you drug them to church? I mean, how concerned are we? Mourning over the desolate and judged land is what they were doing or to do. Verse 11, be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. How, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the, the harvest of the field is perished. Farmers wither up with disappointment. Drunks, ministers, now the farmers, they're all wailing together. Wail, the food is gone. Verse 12. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languished. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field, are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Joy withered away, despair, sadness because of S I N. I like to say it often. What's in the middle of sin? I know. When a nation becomes all about itself and not God, when, they, when we become our own gods, we're, we're just going to be all about self, all about me, myself, and I. That's what we see happening in this country right now. Yeah. The, the concern for God, where is that? I don't know. The concern for others is lacking, desperately lacking. There is a minority, there is a remnant in the church, thank God. One of the joyful times in our church is Thanksgiving. Lots of food. Raise your hand, did you eat too much over the past week? Are we confessing or just raising our hands? Isn't that interesting? We get after our, our we're, we, we like to pick out which sins are the worst. But gluttony somewhere down here. Somebody says, oh my gluttony. <clears throat> Back to the efforts. Uh, big efforts lately, and I'm thankful by the way. Big efforts within a remnant within the church in the Scandia County. Big efforts to share joy lately. I, I know that many of the homeless were fed. Some multiple times. Some very well over the past week. I praise God I see more and more churches reaching out in Scambia County. And you know what? I, I want to just give God praise, but I want to thank God that you guys were way ahead of this thing. Amen. 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 I'll give God praise for that. So let's pray it continues. Uh, you know, you can bring somebody joy this time of year in their despair. Did you know that? Yeah. If going to, uh, it, it, let me say that again. It's going to take the whole body of Christ to get God's work done. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. Now, with abundant blessings, there's a caution. With abundant blessings, I believe the danger is we are so at ease with the blessings we might assume it will always be the case. But is that true? No. 
Apathy thrives with slumber and blessings. Yeah. Apathy slops, strives, uh, excuse me, thrives with slumber and blessings. Verse 13, moving along. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, uh, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withered, is, is withholding, excuse me, from the house of your God. Um, again, the men of God called to mourn, to wear sackcloth, to, to, to fast, a, a scorched earth judgment to spark repentance, to bring revival. And I ask this question off, off, also often, would God allow or bring bad things to bring us back to Him? Yes. yes. To any that are left breathing, how bad does it have to get for you to come to God? If I'm still breathing, and if judgment comes to this country and this earth is scorched and nothing is ever the same in this country, and if this church still stands, and if we're allowed to come here, I pray God gives me the strength to be here at the battleship. Those that don't feel it's important to come now, if they come knocking on the door in such a moment as that, do I say, you know what? You never wanted to come in the first place. Go somewhere else. We don't want them to do with you. Is that your pastor's approach? No. I'll open that door as fast for the, those that are living in apathy today as I would for anybody else. Amen. Those that don't feel it's important now, you know, to show up for church, just a simple thing. If the USA comes under God's judgment, we will receive them in Jesus' name. If you are a prodigal son or daughter, you will be received here in love as long as I'm your pastor. We pray whatever it takes to bring somebody to Jesus. Verse Amen. 14. Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. There's a constant theme throughout the word of God to get to the house of God. A constant theme throughout the word of God to come in and worship. And I'll cry it out in this pulpit till I'm done here. That we're to show up when those doors are open and to give it to Jesus. But I say if you don't want to, stay at home and pray that you will want to. Amen? Amen. Should it take judgment, though, however, to get our nation to fast and go to church? It looks like that is exactly what it's going to take. Would God call for bad things to happen to good people? And let me start with no one is good, by the way. No one in here is good. Did you know that? I'm not good? That's what the Bible says. I'm not good. You're not good. I don't have it together. That's why the people that are broken like to come here. Because there's no pre pretense like we've got it together. Amen. We, we point to the Word of God. That is our bar. That is our mark. Jesus is the example. Amen. So let's start with the fact, Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Could it be could it be that God loves you anyway? He will do whatever it takes, I believe that, to get your attention, to get my attention. So as we prepare to close today, I'm going to read a verse to you, whether it applies to you or not or to this country. Let it sink in. Those of you that are not totally and radically committed to Jesus Christ, Maybe you're here today and you're playing games. Or maybe you've been trying to live without Jesus for a long, long time. Let me, in love, encourage you that there's a better way, and that way is who? Through Jesus Christ. Amen. His way. Him being Lord. To surrender all to Jesus. And 
We pray here on Wednesday nights and throughout the year that God would do whatever it takes to get the lost in the, in the prodigal sons and daughters to come home to Him. Yeah. And when you pray whatever it takes, that means whatever it takes. That might mean a death. It might mean your death. It might mean my death. It might mean sickness. Why would we pray such a thing? Because it's far more important to Jesus and far more important to us and me that people get to heaven than they have a cushy life here on this side. Amen. Amen. So God says, clearly in his word that he loves us, and I like this verse from Revelation 3.19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. That isn't all it says. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Please stand. Please bow your heads just for a moment and let's consider Jesus at this time of invitation. What we do here is at the end of a service, you're given the opportunity to take care of